decisions made out of desperation end up being bad decisions. Because your focus is on the immediate survival. And you might end up doing some things that firms, when their back is against the wall, will always end up doing. And that is, they're in, they're intuitively what they will do is going for a merger or an acquisition, thinking that that's going to solve the problem. It's like someone is very desperate, and then they go for a wedding, right? Go, for, go marry, get a, go into a marriage because they're so desperate, and not realizing that we are so short-term focused that in the long term that decision is actually going to come to hurt you. Now, this is where I want to kind of take us on uh, a, an idea that I've been very interested in pursuing, and that is this whole topic of inspiration versus desperation, and innovation coming out of inspiration versus desperation. Now here's what is fascinating. <clears throat> if you think about innovation or innovativeness or creativity that comes out of inspiration versus desperation, the conventional thinking, and that will be very consistent with the X framework, is that if the brain is experiencing desperation, it is going to be experiencing stress. And therefore, innovation is less likely to emerge from desperation than it will from inspiration. That's the conventional wisdom. Even if innovation emerges from a state of desperation, there'll often be one-shot innovations, not recurring innovations. And the innovation will be restricted to a few individuals in a team rather than more widespread. And a good example of this would be, how many of you have watched uh, Apollo, Apollo 13, the movie Apollo 13, right? And you, if you go back and re-watch that from a desperation inspiration standpoint, it's so fascinating because if you look at who's innovating there, in that situation, and it was desperation, right? It is all about what is the mandate? The mandate there is failure is not an option. We have to bring those three astronauts back to Earth alive. That is the mandate, right? And they look very carefully, the innovation is coming only from two or three individuals. One of them was that astronaut was grounded because he was suspected of having measles. Innovation is coming out from him. All the rest of the people are naysayers. Go back and watch the movie. I mean, it'll be all over. All, I'll say, no, it cannot be done. 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 That's desperation. And, a very, and so it's limited to a few individuals. And the other important <laughs> feature of Apollo 13 was that Apollo 13 of all the Apollo programs had the largest number of people leaving the program after the program was over. When the, pilot, when the astronauts came back to Earth, and you look at the number of people who finally left NASA, they the highest number. Because Innovation coming out of desperation leads to burnout. And people want to, don't want to go back. <clears throat> now, this is conventional thinking. But think about public relations. Think about someone like, you know, like Dave Demarest, who has been in corporate communications, I think. I mean, he was making the statement that he comes into the White House with three things to do, X, Y, Z, and then everything changes because of some crisis somewhere in the world. And they have a change. Which means that there are two, I, as far as I know, there are two kinds of, two professions, at least I'm familiar with, you might know more. One is public relations, and one is the newsroom, it be the television or be it newspapers, where it is a constant state of desperation. And yet, a lot of innovation emerges from that desperation, which is very, very, very strict. It shouldn't be happening, <coughs> but it happens. And so one question I have for you folks who are experts in public relations, and we've probably been through this in the past. I mean, does it simply have to do with that the people who excel in public relations are somehow different beasts altogether? I mean, personality-wise? I mean, I've heard these stories. In fact, I asked Dave, uh, Dave this kind of question, is that, uh, would you like to go back to the White House? And he said, no. And then I asked him, do you miss it? And he said, yeah, why do you miss it? And he said, because I miss the adrenaline rush. You remember the conversation? Mm -hmm. He misses the, misses the rush. Uh, of course, now it is in retrospect, right? In retrospect, you know, let's go back and say, yeah, I missed the crush and so on. I don't know how he experienced, how the experience was, when all these things were taking place. But any thoughts about that in terms of why is it that you folks somehow thrive and, and, and continuously you get this recurring innovation, innovativeness, creativity, that's why being put in a spot in states of desperation. I wonder if there's not a difference between crisis and desperation. Uh, I, I, I equate them, and if, if you think they're different, then let me know. Because I don't think crisis crisis, crisis, crisis is fun. Uh, see, that's, <laughs> that, that means you're reframing it. So it, it might be the case that somehow you folks over a period of time, and that's why you're successful, is that you reframe crises as a challenge. Yeah. And challenges are very really expensive. 
much. <laughs> Great. Any other thoughts? I think even better is frame this an opportunity, right? <clears throat> because how you respond to something yeah. tells us a lot about you. So it's not desperation. It's like this uh, potential for innovation is higher. I mean, this is strange because if in a normal circumstances, and I've seen this happening, but I teach the D school as well, and, and you'll get groups that get into situations of desperation because the challenge becomes so big, they can't solve it. And the first instinct there, they get stressed, and the first instinct is simply to back out and not revisit the challenge at all. <coughs> what do you folks going to do? I think one of the major <coughs> differences is that we think of it in terms of messaging, which is creative, which is sort of a rush, rather than a strict business process where there's an outcome that is, is either failure or success, we look at it in terms of what's the best message to get to the target audience or public that we're looking at. And so we actually reframe it much like Ward said. It, it's a challenge. Let's put together a new message. So I want, to, I want to revisit that, but I have my own hypothesis. Before I lay that hypothesis in there, anyone else put some thoughts on it? I would about? say also that in our profession, uh, when people are, have desperation and when there are desperate situations, um, there's more value placed on our participation, Interesting. on our ideas, Interesting. on our... That's very, um, Frank, will you make a note? Someone make a note on our involvement. Oh, no, forget it. Yeah, and so, very so that changes the nature of why we come into something like that. So it's not necessarily our desperation. That's interesting. The firm is desperate. So it might be the case that the firm, the, no, when I say the firm, I'm talking about the enterprise, right? The enterprise is facing a crisis right now. And who do they, they need comfort. So what do they do? I mean, typically what do, what do enterprises do? They don't go to communications people. I mean, I, I, we're talking about best practices, but from what I understand, the first instinct is to go to the legal team. And that's the worst probably thing because you're not fighting the battle in the court of a law right now, you're fighting the battle in the court of public opinion. But I think in terms of best practices, I guess what happens is that they, they get comfort by going to someone who's an expert and say, you know what, can you help me out? You know, you, you're the one who can save us right now, and therefore, now you feel empowered, and you're not taking it on as a challenge to kind of handle the crisis. One of the things, we don't tend to look at this as a quick fix when there's a, an issue. The, the, the CEO may say, I've got to fix this now, but we understand that it's going to take a long time to fix this, so we're not necessarily looking to this today, tomorrow, next week, we're in it for the long, long haul. It's easier to, in many ways, to, to manage it that way. Because you're not looking for the one big win. I'm just keep getting, I'm just going to try it tomorrow or the day after that. Interesting. After that. So you're breaking this down into kind of what, what do I do tomorrow? It's, it's one day at a time. Right. What are we doing? How do we define success now one day at a time? And being able to communicate to the CEO that, you know what, this is not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be one step and you've got to be, along, be with us along the way. We will take care of the messaging. We'll take care of what, how you're going to talk to the markets and so on and so forth. Right? So you need to have a CEO who's not looking for a quick fix. Which is true, but the problem is many CEOs and the, their boss of the boards need the quick fix. That's right. But the right fix is not the quick fix. Interesting. And so do you, do you feel that, that, that tug of war within all the time? Interesting. I think there's sort of an occupational uh, dilemma that, that conscious folks in our field and you know, other staff fields have, but particularly ours, in the sense that you, know, you have to both be process uh, mindful, if you will, and, and manage that well, at the same time, uh, be able to handle events uh, that may arise. And, and so then, to kind of underscore a lot of these comments too, I think it's what you're rewarded for. You may be bought in in a crisis to handle an event. If you're on the inside, yes, you've got to do that, but you also have to manage your staff and do the administrative things and you know, more of the process kinds of activities. Right to come with that job. So, so you know, and, and how you're uh, measured and how your uh, value shifts, you know, depending on where the company is, how, what the perception of your function is, all those things. So we have to kind of bounce back and forth between those poles and sometimes almost, you know, daily or daily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll come, I mean, so one of the things that is interesting with your, your thing on that, even the legal, not legal, sorry, I'm, why am I kind of saying legal, even the, the newsroom kind of thing, right? One of the things that is very interesting with what you folks do is that you have times when you can be, uh, you can work under inspiration and times when you can work under desperation, right? So there are going a lot of times when you're being proactive. Uh, I'm doing something, I'm, I'm having a press release and so on. And then from time to time you get into a situation of desperation because there's a crisis um, and, and how do you react? And it is at those times I see that you folks come out in a recurring fashion being very creative, and that's what I'm trying to understand. So I'll, I'll present my hypotheses 
uh, which is consistent with some of the remarks that are coming out there, but there were at least a couple more people who wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to uh, address, you know, you, you mentioned the, the legal situation that yeah. a lot of companies uh, in, in a crisis will tend to go to legal before they go to communication. And that's changing a bit, particularly over the last 10 to 15 it's years. And, and one of the reasons it's changing is the companies that have gone that route bear names like Enron and Global Crossing and Tyco and, and Health South and so forth and so on. Yeah. And uh, the, um, there are other, there, uh, uh, there, although some people will say there's a lot of similarities between legal and communications, there's a lot of differences. Um, um, when I talk about that with my students, I don't talk about the court of public opinion. I talk about the arena of public opinion because court implies that both sides of the story get to be told. Right. And that's not what happens right. in the public opinion arena. Often, if you get your message out there first, yeah. you know, yeah. and, uh, uh, and 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 I think we're seeing uh, a, 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 a better position and more savvy group of corporate public relations officers today in in. In, you know, not in all the companies, but in the most successful companies. So, I mean, just to add to that, one of, one of the things in terms of best practices, and of course, I'm, I'm a novice to uh, public relations, so if I'm saying something stupid, please do uh, bear with me. <laughs> but one thing I do, I think to notice is that when you have the head of corporate communications reporting directly to the CEO, not reporting to a legal team or not, when you have these uh, funny kind of relationships like you're reporting to marketing or so on and so on, whereas reporting directly to the CEO is when I think these enterprises are able to handle crisis much better uh, because they are at the table when the crisis hits uh, and they're also at the table when you know it's inspiration, you're thinking about strategy in the future and so on. Uh, and, and I wonder how many good uh, uh, enterprises now have uh, the head of corporate communications reporting directly to the CEO. It's about 50 50. 50, 50. Yeah, I mean, so it would be interesting to see that balance. If, you, if it is reporting to the CEO, then what happens? What are the outcomes when there's a crisis versus if it is not 50, not reporting to the CEO? What and it's not only uh, who do you report to, it's how do you report. That's right. Yeah. I, I think the speed issue is quite interesting. Um, that because when we're dealing with their reputations, we tell them it's going to take a long time. Right. But actually, with the crisis, I find that they, they, they get into a kind of inertia. Um, and and, and I, I'm often advising clients, look, as soon as you can get the story out, it's over. But, right. if, you, but if you keep delaying, right. the speculation rules, and the crisis grows. And so actually, I'm, I'm trying to get them to, to get on with it. You know it's wrong, tell it draw a line under it and move on. So we yeah. change speed during the crisis. Right, I mean the interesting thing there is that the first instinct, go back to the <coughs> X framework frame when you're stressed, the first instinct is to put your head in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you a lot of comfort because I don't have to deal with all these noises yeah. and so on. Or the first instinct would be to run away somewhere to you know some island out there and hide. I mean metaphorically, but that's, there are sometimes it happens in real life. Uh, I think for, for them, they're desperate and already happening and they're focusing on that where I think we send we look at an issue or a crisis we think okay it's, you you get less blame for what happened you get more blame for how you handle it and I think we're thinking creatively right, how are we going to handle this to manage it to a good outcome to us a good outcome means changing the conversation or you know getting to a neutral position from a very negative position and it gets us thinking I think a lot more creatively and so we're not in that desperate Interesting. So again, it's kind of how you reframe that. I want to introduce a different element. Uh, yeah. Let's say as an example, a company has a set of deeply held values that promote a sense of well-being among people. Right. So that whatever the conditions are, they fall back first on those as they have a decision-making process they go through. What's your thinking about that as it relates to, we can look back to companies like uh, Johnson & Johnson, for example, yeah. I don't know, where the credo yeah. Yeah. played a role in their decision making, oh, but also encouraged them, absolutely. rather than moving to desperation, they moved along the yeah. path. I mean, my, my, when people ask me this question about Johnson & Johnson, I would say that the Johnson & Johnson scenario will not play out in today's environment. So impossible. I mean, I'd be, I'd, I'd remember, I'm a member of board of two companies, and it is incredibly difficult with all these quarterly earnings and stuff like that, where CEOs being rewarded per quarter where you cannot have this big kind of thing to say, I'm going to take away everything from the store, I and mean, that could have happened to Johnson & Johnson. Right. And Johnson & Johnson also had very deep pockets at the current right. time. Right? 
uh, it's less, it's, again, it's, it's, it's like you've talked about, it's this tension that occurs where the CEO is reporting to the board, is reporting to the markets, and you know, worried about stock share values and so on. The entire organization is geared towards that. The corporate uh, communication chief is now is the conscious of the organization to say, I have to adopt a complete a holistic perspective in this. It's not about winning the market, winning this, winning this. I want the winning to be kind of more kind of global, right? I mean, um, and the question then is going to be that is is that. Uh, the head of corporate communications is going to be heard or not. And it goes back to the kind of relationship that the person has yep. with the CEO of the board yep. uh, and so on. And I think that's where it has this... Uh, I'll give you my hypothesis here. And, and uh, my hypothesis is kind of closely aligned but not, not perfectly aligned. And that is, there's a difference between desperation with deadlines and desperation without deadlines. Hmm. There's something about that. When I have my D-School students and design school students um, have deadlines, uh, you will see that there's a lot of creativity, that, there's a lot more creativity that emerges from there than if I don't give them a deadline. And I don't know how many of you experience this, but being an academic, and there are some academics out here, is this, for example, I'll have a grant deadline. Let's say an NSF grant or an NIS grant deadline. And typically they'll come in on a Monday or a Tuesday. And I'll be procrastinating for a month, <laughs> not even <laughs> touching the everything. Procrastinating, and then comes the weekend before, and that's when I'm burning the midnight oil. And then I get it, and then I go back and I say, how the heck was I so creative? And that's, the, the output that comes out of that is can never be done if there had not been a deadline. Mm -hmm. And you cannot go back and recreate it. And there's something about that, the pleasure of the last minute and so on. And I have a feeling that what happens when you have a deadline is that you turn from being a maximizer to a satisfizer. You're not looking for the best outcome, but you're looking for an outcome that is going to save the day. That is a satisfizer. And what, a satisfy, what happens with satisfizing is that it brings, it brings down the levels of stress. I'm not looking for the best outcome. I'm just looking for a good outcome. And therefore, I'm less stressed right now. And when you're less stressed, you're more likely, therefore, to reframe that desperation as a challenge. <coughs> that, that's my way of thinking about it. And it's, it's quite possible that one thing that's very common when you talk about the configuration of the newsrooms is that, is that you have deadlines. Something has to go out today. So we have to do something today. It's not like an endless desperation that occurs, right? In innovation, you can have this endless desperation. Because you're, you're kind of working on a problem, nothing happens. You work on a problem, nothing happens. The challenge becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. There are no deadlines out there. And that's when what will happen is that people will take the comfort zone and start playing. So this is just a thesis that I have.